So, so let's let's do something a little bit different here. I want to I want to end up talking about the professional working relationship that you have, but it wouldn't be as unique as it is if it wasn't also personal. And then it did happen at one point where I looked at him and I said, I'm going back to my apartment. I've been paying rent all these months and my place is empty <laughs> I need and, to I'm, use it. and I'm done with that. And Chris, I think almost spit out his food and he said, well, well, well I think we should live together. <laughs> and I great. said, oh, great idea. There you go. <laughs> Let me end my lease. And uh, one of the tenets of our faith, which is tikkun olam, to repair the world. Ah, and we are responsible, you know, for repairing the world. So yes, I yes. come by it honestly. And it is something that is foundational, I think, for Chris's and my relationship. Mm. And what we have to be careful of is that we're not so responsible for fixing the world or and changing everybody else and saving everybody else. And that we also come back to ourselves sure. and um, not all the time be obligated out there. Sure. So... There's more to the two of you than the ordinance. There's more to the two of you than your work. I, I mean, I hardly know you, but I know this is true yeah. of both of you. And there's also something special about Chris and Jessica. So how did you preserve and protect and nurture that in the middle of this, you know, maelstrom of activity, this cauldron, this, you know, how did you do that? I'm your host, Mark Good, and this is Remarkable, a podcast focused on people and stories worthy of your attention. And now, today's show. It's another episode of my Remarkable podcast, and I'm glad to welcome back as guest Jessica Columbi, whom I met actually last fall here in Shaker on another podcast that I was doing. And I, I can say this on this episode, your husband, Chris Nance. Mm -hmm. The two of us, uh, the three of us have been talking previously about the community benefits ordinance that has been passed in Cleveland as the result of uh, the work of many people, but quite frankly, spearheaded in many ways by the two of you. And um, I did not know when I was first talking with Jessica that the two of you were married, Jessica would say, oh, but you, you need to have Christopher Nance, you know, be a part of the discussion. And he was really involved. And so, and so I'm looking on LinkedIn, right? And I'm going, Christopher Nance, I like get vice president of construction and greater good partnership. Oh, well, that's interesting, you know? And, you know, you need to do this. And then Jessica would keep coming back to, you know, Christopher Nance, Christopher Nance. And then finally at one point she goes, well, actually he's my husband. <laughs> And I was like, that's a story. <laughs> so, so, so let's, let's do something a little bit different here. I want to, I want to end up talking about the professional working relationship that you have, but it wouldn't be as unique as it is if it wasn't also personal. So let's talk about, I mean, you both, you've mentioned in a previous episode, you both grew up here in Shaker. Did you know each other when you were? kids in Shaker by any chance? No, we grew up in the same neighborhood a few years apart. Ah, okay. Okay. So a few years apart. Um, when did you become acquainted? Let me put it to you that way. Wait, tell me the story. Okay. Oh, gosh. <laughs> be, be careful what you ask for, Mark. <laughs> this is, a, you know, we, um, no, no conversation is complete without uh, a few Yiddish words. Of so, course, absolutely. So, um, the shtick that, in response to your question, is something that we often reflect on, Jess. Um, so, in 2004, the presidential election of 2004, you know, George Bush was elected. Right. And we thought times were ending then. <laughs> right, right. Um, how little did we know? How little did we know? How uh, good he would appear yes, in retrospect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of Yiddish. Yeah. Um, so, and the 2004 election was also questionable. Right. 
in a lot of ways. And Chris can go on a di- that's a different podcast, but Chris can speak in detail about um, having done the the ground level research on all the inconsistencies in the 2004 election. At the time, I was a barista at Starbucks because I had quit my full time job, my hmm. first job. No, my second job. Um, I was a development assistant at what was the Diabetes Association of Greater Cleveland. Mm. The war in Iraq broke out, yep. and um, I was absolutely sick about it. I thought, why are we starting a war in Iraq and Afghanistan for no reason? Right. Neither of these countries had anything to do with September 11th, and I don't believe there are weapons of mass destruction and all of that. And right. So I thought, well, I'm going for the top. You know, I'm going to volunteer in the presidential election so that I can make sure that I have a say in who leads our country next, because I don't like the kinds of decisions that are being made. And and let me pause right here, because I think there's something really important that's also through line about you as an individual. And, and, you know, we've only chatted a few times, but you have in, in this comment, and then I'll please continue with the narrative. You have this conviction that as a citizen, we have a responsibility and we have agency and we need to take action. And so listening to you into that, because you weren't 18 at that, well, maybe you were. I was not, I was a little older than that. You were a little older than 18, exactly. So you had some life underneath your Mm -hmm. belt, and Mm -hmm. yet you still felt like, I need to do something about this because this bothers me. And so that sense of agency, and you engaged in the, in the election, mm-hmm. right? Because you wanted to make a difference. And I, I think for listeners, that's an important thing to really understand you, Jessica, to understand mm-hmm. you, Chris, mm-hmm. and quite frankly, as a model for all of us as citizens, mm-hmm. that we need to have that, res- mm-hmm. accept the responsibility of what mm-hmm. it means to be a citizen mm-hmm. and to be engaged. So it, enough of that. No, that's okay. I mean, Back to two, your story. Two things I'll say about that. First of all, uh, my parents were in inter- intermarriage, uh, but they agreed to raise me Jewish. And one of the things that I've learned um, that is part of my cultural Judaism, but I think it's directly related to uh, one of the tenets of our faith, which is tikkun olam, to repair the world. Ah, and interesting. we are responsible you know, for repairing the world. So yes, I yes. come by it honestly. And it is something that is foundational, I think, for Chris's and my relationship relationship Mm. and what we have to be careful of is that we're not so responsible for fixing the world or and changing everybody else and saving everybody else and that we also come back to ourselves and um, not all the time be obligated out there sure so but yes I quit my full-time job to which my family was like what (laughs) and they always also instilled in me you must have health insurance like this is the most important thing so I got a job at Starbucks right because they offered terrific health insurance and a flexible enough schedule that I could go off and campaign on these in a in a presidential election and my candidate was Wes Clark the retired four-star general Mm -hmm. General. and um, I remembered him specifically from the way that he uh, well he was a he was an not an anchor, but he was oftentimes a guest on CNN talking about the Mm. Iraq war precisely because of his experience in the Bosnia-Herzegovina war, Mm -hmm. where he led the, um, you know, coalition Mm -hmm. effort, got it, went in, got Milosevic, got out. So he had a terrific record in foreign policy and in wartime things. And I thought, this is the guy, you know, a la um, Eisenhower. Right. And uh, he also was a white guy from Little Rock, Arkansas, talking about how affirmative action worked, Mm. specifically in the military. But Mm. that also got my attention because it was quite novel and profound at the time in 2003 and 2004. So I quit my job, started working at Starbucks, drove to New Hampshire, went door to door for Wes Clark, came back, came back to Cleveland and Wes Clark obviously didn't make it right. and uh, just kept working at Starbucks as the presidential race went on. And so 2004, John Kerry is elected. Right. And one of my regular customers said to me, you know, Charlie Rangel, who's a congressman. You mean John York, Kerry was nominated? John Kerry was nominated, right, and right. then lost. Right. And so in November of 2004, Congressman Charlie Rangel from New York was coming to Cleveland to speak to us about the inconsistencies and the concern over this 2004 presidential election. Oh, interesting. Um, Okay. In addition to a second term of George W. Bush, there were also, again, all these voting irregularities and inconsistencies and, you know, what was the impact? And one of my regular customers said, you know, you really should come tonight. There's a lecture. It's at Twing Hall at Case Hmm. and um, you should come. 
And so I did. And it was part of a lecture series that was named after Lou Stokes, who was, of course, a distinguished graduate of that institution, and, and Stephanie Tubbs-Jones. And was the host of the um, event that evening, Lou Stokes was. And Stephanie Tubbs-Jones, who was the congresswoman at the time for Northeast Ohio. Right. Um, it was also part of her because she was standing on his shoulders yep. uh, and she was also sort of co-hosting yep, the event. My, my old boss, I was working for Stephanie. So I'm literally sitting in the last row or so of Twing Ballroom. Right. Our, our eyes met across a crowded ballroom, if you can believe it. So Chris got up to take a phone call and as he was exiting the ballroom, we made eye contact and I right. thought, wow, that man is handsome. <laughs> and <laughs> and then it. And then the lecture opened up into question and answer. Right. Uh, okay. Eventually. Here so Chris we go. had come this, back. This is the good part. Yeah. So the lecture opened up into question and answer. Right. And I asked a very provocative, I, I guess it was provocative. I didn't think it was provocative. It at was the time. provocative. <laughs> and Chris remembers, I mean, he could speak for himself, turning around and saying, gosh, who is that woman asking that question? Who is this young whippersnapper? Um, disrespecting our visiting member of Congress being hosted by one of the most revered political figures in in Ohio and uh, history, Lou Stokes, uh, being uh, co-hosted by the current sitting member of Congress. Continue. That, that was your thought. <laughs> so after yeah, after the event, I met a couple of girlfriends when there was still a Winking Lizard Tavern on Coventry, and I met a couple of girlfriends there. And as we were walking out of the Winking Lizard, Chris was walking in. And I said, hey, are you the one that asked that question at the lecture this evening? Can I buy you a drink? Can so I buy we you a drink? Right. sat at the bar. My girlfriends went to the coffee shop next door and sent me a text to say, we have no idea who this man is that we just left you with. <laughs> we'll be next door. Let us know if you need anything. Chris and I sat for literally two and a half hours. Yep, and we were, chat we were chatting it up. <clears throat> and I was so impressed with myself, Mark, because, you know, working for Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones, who in her own right, um, God bless uh, her memory, uh, was just an extraordinary individual. And I had those really impressive, uh, you worked in Washington, D.C., so you know that folks who worked on the Hill had these beautifully, uh, these beautiful white business cards that were gold embossed. Oh, yes. Right? Uh, they're gorgeous, oh, yes. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, right? They're beautiful, right? Yeah, right. So, the at the, so at the end of the evening, I gave Jessica my very impressive congressional business card <laughs> with my phone number on it. Uh -huh. I did not ask her for her phone number because after all, I mean, of course, I gave her a gold you. embossed business card. <laughs> now here's where the story gets interesting. Now, Mark, this is now you're on, you're supposed, you think you're asking the questions. Now I'm asking you the questions. The question is how long did it take for Jessica to call me back? You're on first guest. I'll give you, I'll give you two, I'll give you three guesses. Okay, so I would think at least kind of the setup here, because also I'm getting the energy that Jessica was and remains a very self-confident person. There you go. Who is not um, easily impressed. You could tell that by the question that I believe she mm -hmm. asked. So maybe um, uh, a couple of days. Okay, first guess. Right. Uh, uh, no, that's N no a more. A little more. Um, a week, maybe? Okay. Two, you get one more. Third strike, you're out. Wow. Just so, get, get ballpark. Just get ballpark. That may be two weeks. Eight plus months. <gasps> that's oh, my it. God. Exactly. Ex my response, exact now, there was a little bit of life that happened, a little bit of water that sure, needed to run sure, under the bridge sure. between, you know, that evening at the Winking Lizard and eight and a half months later. Right. And then when she reached back out to me, she sent me an email. <laughs> Would you like to describe to Mark and anyone who's still listening what the email said? Hello, Mr. Nance. Mr. Nance. Right. It's like, really? <laughs> I hope you remember who I am. We met at the Winking Lizard, and we talked about growing up on Chadbourne and Huntington Roads. Right. And, you know, I, I thought I would make a point. At that point, I was also working for a state senator hmm. uh, who represented Northeast Ohio in Columbus. So you'd moved from Starbucks. Moved. Yes. Yep. Yes. Shout out to Senator uh, Eric Fingerhut, okay. who, who remains a, a friend and, and mentor. Important of, shoulders that I'm standing on. Right. And, uh, and so I was working in the Ohio State Senate, which is where all sorts of the voter ID laws started to be developed and passed. And I right. said, I know that the congresswoman has a 
specific interest in this kind of thing. And so, you know, we can stay in touch about that. Right. Then we went from emailing work, right. work account to work account. Chris right. said, you know, next time you come above the Mason Dixon line in Ohio, which is otherwise known as I-480, <laughs> well, let me know you're in town. And, um, and so I did come and visit actually the congressional office. He was not there. And so we did this dance. First, it was over work, uh, email and phone. And then next thing I know, he's calling me on my personal cell phone after work hours and mm. we would have these long conversations. Mm. And we did the dance. Uh, of course, we both went to Shaker Homecoming the following October. Well, that October. So this is July we're talking about. We right. started to reconnect. Of 05 now, correct? If I'm 2005, correct. 2005, because yes, yes. it's been eight months. That yes, like, yes, the following amazing. year. Right, and, eight months. And, and then into October of 2005, we both went to Shaker Homecoming because mm. that's how Shaker is. Right. And we went out for a drink after that, had right. another two and a half hour conversation. And then again, did the dance a little bit longer until December when Chris invited me over for dinner. Mm. I was to bring dessert. And I walked up, and this was when December was cold. I mean, so, I was And that was frozen. when I fell in love with Jess and strawberry rhubarb pie. I don't know oh, if, yes. if you've ever had strawberry. Oh, that, but the it, strawberry rhubarb pie from Miles Market is like... That will weaken the will of any man. Exactly. <laughs> yes. and, and I have been weakened ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Miles Market is one of our secret but favorite yes. shopping places, and... I love strawberry rhubarb park. So yes, so you brought that. I brought that. That is a, bl a, a, a that's a, a, a shop below the belt. I mean, yeah. honestly, yeah. that's unfair. <laughs> I well, mean, you and let me tell you how Chris made dinner. Okay. So what what's what's important is I walked up to the front door, right? Because I'm respectful, and Chris came out the back door, walked down the driveway, and said, "What are you doing at my front door?" And I said, "Well, we've never met before. Why would I just walk in your back door?" And he right. said, "Come, come down here." So I walked down the front stoop, and I met him in the driveway, and he gave me this big hug. And as we were pulling apart, he said, "You know, let's just get this kiss over with," and kissed me in the driveway. Oh, I and, love this! And we have been together ever since. Oh, so, that is such a great story. The evening when I, I went into the house, he had a fire in the fireplace. How he nice. had flowers on the coffee table, and he started to bring out the pieces and parts of dinner right. that I was a bachelor. That he had procured. I had not been to the grocery store in all year. A, in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he came out with sushi, you right. know, prepared by which Heinen's. He, which she hates. I hate at the time I hated sushi. Okay. I've come right. around. But so he brings out sushi prepared from the grocery store. Then he brings out potato salad. Also from the prepared section That's at the grocery store. That's an odd choice yep. to make then sushi and potato salad. brings out cheese and crackers. Okay. Then he brings out pasta salad, also hmm. from the prepared food section. And then he brings out pre-cut fruit. You know, where you peel right. the cellophane off the top. It's yeah. like pre-cut and pre-packaged. <laughs> I mean, that's where bachelors shop in the prepared food section yeah, of grocery stores. I, I mean, get it. I mean, I'm not making anything, so I couldn't figure out. I didn't know how to cook anything, so I just went to the prepared foods, and I grabbed the first thing <laughs> that I could find and just <laughs> brought it all home and then just brought it all, all, all at once. There was no real rhythm or rhyme to it. And then strawberry rhubarb pie was and dessert. And I think his, as he said, which saved the day. I yes. think he said, I think he said, my toes are tingling. <laughs> <laughs> and we've literally been together ever since. That was yeah. December of two thousand five. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Wow. Yeah. And, and this was you were living in Shaker at that time, correct? Yes, I had um, just recently moved back to uh, Cleveland uh, from the uh, East Coast after uh, going through a, a big life change, separation, and divorce. Sure. Uh, uh, my children were 13 and 9, and uh, my dad was still here uh, at the time in the family home at Shaker uh, that my parents had bought in the late 1960s, and so I was living in the family home ah. as my dad was uh, snowbirding uh, in Florida, in Florida which, right. which he did for 30 years. So uh, it was um, it was kind of a unique opportunity to get reconnected to uh, the family home, and that helped to kind of facilitate Jess and I getting back together, you know, growing up literally in the same neighborhood, two right. streets away from each other, as wow. I mentioned, a few years apart in age, but from a values, what's important in life perspective. I'll never forget us sitting in the stands of the Shaker Heights uh, football stadium as we looked uh, from that stadium at Shaker Heights High across the field to uh, Onaway Elementary School, where right. we both went to elementary yep. school, yep. Uh, to Woodbury, the, the middle school. 
uh, we we were connected instantly by a whole host of seminal shared experiences. Tell me, and and I love the love story. I'm listen. I'm a guy, and I love love stories. It's wonderful. I mean, I, I just I, I love love stories, and so yours is remarkable. And um, of course, I, I I have to say this to you, Chris, because lessons learned. I'm a business development guy, yeah. entrepreneur, CEO always get the number yeah i know the, i mean come on i mean this is just like I but mean, he was very special always get know? the number i've got I, did, I get, did i tell you i had a gold embossed <laughs> business card did i tell you that <laughs> I, it, it's not about your gold card it's about this lady yeah, here they, i mean dude, right come on exactly i mean which is why i had to wait yeah <laughs> well I, you know the universe had a reason and oh, oh it did. yes it did you know so 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 now you're together as a couple yeah and yet and you're working for what i believe at that time it was a state senator correct mm -hmm. and who were you working for the i was state. working for congresswoman tubbs, tubbs jones okay tubbs jones so both the interesting both political sort of roles assignments jobs mm -hmm. right so let's spin the tape forward a little bit. How did you, how have your careers developed since then? You know, and it, keep in mind that you know you are now a couple. How did your careers develop? I mean, did you talk about hey, you ought to do this or why don't we do that? I mean, how did that happen? Well, remarkably enough, uh, after the two thousand four election, um, naturally, then the the mid the mid cycle. Uh, in 2006, the, 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 the midterm elections, the midterm midterm elections, elections right. in 2006, which was statewide elections in the state of Ohio. Right. So uh, that was when I was working on the arts and culture levy mm. um, that uh, passed for the first time, even though they had tried many times. And Chris and I, of course, were, were hanging out uh, here in Cleveland. No, no, I was in Columbus. OK, but Eric uh, Fingerhut, who was the state senator at the time, was asked to run that arts and arts and culture levy. So he brought me back to Cleveland with him to work on that. Right. And because we really wanted the con the congresswoman's support, you know, Chris was my best contact in that office. So I remember visiting each other at the campaign office. Long story a little bit short there. The, ar uh, the arts campaign office. Yes. The Ted Strickland was elected governor. A very his his first act was to work on a piece of legislation with the Republican Speaker of the House and the Republican President of the Senate as a Democratic governor to pass House Bill One, which made higher education part of the governor's cabinet. It otherwise the Board of Regents had kind of been hanging out here as its own right. entity, and um, and then they appointed Eric Fingerhut as the Chancellor of the Ohio Board of Regents, and Eric said to me, "I want you to come with me," and mm. I said what the hell is the Board of Regents? Right. So he explained to me how that worked, and I moved down to Columbus. Well, within a week of that job offer, Congresswoman Tubbs Jones got a phone call. From the newly elected Secretary of State, Jennifer Bruner, the first woman to be elected Secretary of State here in the state of Ohio. And I was then offered a job opportunity uh, with uh, Secretary Bruner to serve as the Assistant Secretary of State. And similar to Jess's response to Eric Fingerhut, what's a Board of Regents? I said to Secretary Bruner, I said, how many Assistant Secretaries do you have? <laughs> and she's like, only one and you're second in authority to me. And I said, well, that sounds like a good job. <laughs> right. So I walked back into the office and I said to Congresswoman Tubbs Jones, Jennifer just offered me this amazing job. I said, I don't know. Do you think I should take it? She was like, are you kidding me? That's what I am about. I'm about creating and opening up opportunities for my folks. You go down there and you do a heck of a job making sure that we get Ohio's election system back on track. Wow. And that was, um, and so we literally got jobs in state government within a week or so of in each Col other. In Columbus. In Columbus. In Columbus, yeah. And, then, um, and so. We both moved down to Columbus. And we, mo we both moved down to Columbus. So how about that? That is amazing. There's sort of a synchronicity to this. In Yiddish, we refer to it as beshert. 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 It's meant to be. It's meant to be. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, so we moved down to Columbus. So, you, so, so we worked in Columbus. Oh my gosh, it was it was foot on the gas yep. downhill for right. a couple of years. Right. And Chris came back to Cleveland first to run the Secretary of State's open her Cleveland office. Right. Uh, didn't exist at the time. But even before you do that, I mm -hmm. think it's important because 
you know, Jess was where, you know, Eric Fingerhut was a, a transformational leader for Ohio's higher educational system. Uh, Jennifer Bruner was a transformational leader of the Secretary of State's office, having worked in the Secretary of State's office uh, with, uh, at the time, uh, <clears throat> Sharon Brown, understood how the office worked, and we had a responsibility to make sure that every duly registered citizen in the state of Ohio had the opportunity to cast a vote and to make sure that that vote was counted because we had the primary election for the for the uh, presidency of the United States. And so we were both deeply involved in transformational uh, efforts uh, in this instance uh, at the state government level. So, so tell me, you're now uh, a couple. You're living, I assume, together in Columbus, right? Together and apart. Together and apart. The well, we each we each had a place. Right. I think I only spent a couple of nights in my place before I was in his place. And then it did happen at one point where I looked at him and I said, I'm going back to my apartment. I've been paying rent all these months and my place is empty. <laughs> I need and to I'm, use it. And I'm done with that. And Chris, I think, almost spit out his food and he said, well, well, well I think we should live together. <laughs> and I great. said, oh, great idea. There you go. <laughs> Let me end my lease. And, and interestingly enough, we spent most of our weekends in Cleveland. We worked all kinds of crazy hours in Columbus, uh, Monday through Friday. And the first thing we would do as soon as we were done working on Friday is that we would hop in the car and drive back to Cleveland. We, um, had, to, we had to create physical space in order to create some mental space because the jobs were so intense. Well, I was going to ask you, um, because I think this is important in understanding where you are today yeah. and the collaboration <laughs> that you have done to get the community benefits ordinance passed. Tell me, it, you certainly were bringing home, when I say home, back to your shared space, the concerns, the issues, the battles, the struggles, the victories of your jobs and talking with each other. Because my sense is, and I don't know you guys well, but my sense is, is that th that was an easy conversation to have. You're both kind of in the, that world or those worlds. You could share, you could, you know, I don't want to say commiserate, but you could say, hey, this happened. What do you think? Like, it, would that be a fair? I mean, help me understand. Is that what happened? I mean, yes. So you would so you would have those conversations, right? Yes. And g gain insight and perspective and share advice with one another. Yes. Both of whom are kind of in the battle together, right? Not the same, not the same office, right? You're not in the same, you don't have the same employers, but you're in that same world, right, mm -hmm. of state government. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yet our our shared point of reference, uh, Cleveland and Shaker Heights, Ohio, helped ground us and connect us as a couple, while we were navigating the tremendously difficult and complex um, aspects of uh, running state agencies uh, within the state of Ohio, which there's a reason that individuals who win the presidency of the United States target Ohio, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, because Ohio continues to represent this uh, melting pot of what America is mm. uh, from, uh, let's just say, from uh, the most traditional uh, to the most progressive and all in between. And so in order to enact and to make, basically to put laws in effect in the state of Ohio, uh, the level of complexity uh, is something that we had to learn, we had to come to appreciate and navigate in we were just both extremely fortunate to be a part of almost like Camelot type teams. Right. Uh, at Jess at the Board of Regents, and for me uh, in the Secretary of State's office, where we were not by ourselves in this shared commitment for uh, believing that transformational change was possible, even here in the uh, great state of Ohio. So. So what year is this? This is about what two thousand and eight, ten, something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. That you're been. So this was about two thousand. Yes, yes. Yep. So fourteen, fifteen years ago. Right. And as I'm listening to you, Chris, de describe the work in government that you and Jess were doing 
and you use words like transformational. Mm -hmm. You talk about this spectrum from, you know, I would say rural to urban, both sides of the aisle, and, and bringing all of those stakeholders together, which is part of the complexity of passing mm -hmm. legislation mm -hmm. or ordinances or anything, is that it, you're not dealing with a unified constituency unified in this it's a uniform i should say uniform constituency right yeah, it's yeah, highly right diverse different motives different perspectives you know different hot buttons different things that matter and yet both of you were required to sort of herd those cats mm -hmm. together right to make stuff happen would that be a fair statement well you also had to listen right and learn Right. Coming from Cuyahoga County, for just to bring forward a specific example, at the time, the Board of Elections, the Secretary of State's office, oversees the state's election system, uh, which is comprised of individual boards of elections in all 88 counties. At the time, the Board of Elections here in Cuyahoga County had about 100 employees. And so my mindset, having had the responsibility via the congresswoman to work actively with the Cuyahoga County Board of Elections. When I was named Assistant Secretary of State, I went to Columbus. I assumed that all boards of elections, you know, had, you know, 50, 60, 100 employees. Well, there are many counties who are so small uh, through in the state of Ohio that there were only two full-time employees, wow. a director and a deputy director. And by... Uh, in accordance with Ohio Revised Code, every board has four board members, two Republicans and two Democrats. So some boards of elections only had six people wow. who were specifically engaged. And yet we had a transformational strategy right. that was being advanced by uh, Secretary of State Bruner that included a whole host of significant operational, administrative, and technical changes. But when that landed in our smaller counties, on the desks of two people. Hmm. They were like, how are we gonna do this? Right, right. And so we had to be able to calibrate right. our uh, expectations, not for outcomes, but we had to calibrate the strategy right. in order to match up with the realities of the diversity hmm. of what is Ohio and the where people live. And uh, that was, I think, one of the most important experiences uh, that I had is that it creates both a, a practical empathy right. for transformational change. Not everybody is in the same place. Right. Not, not everyone has the same capacity. Right. And that does not lessen um, in any ways disrespect the individuals. People just have different experiences. They have different resources. Sure. They have different bases of experience. Um, so that was a very important, that was a really critical part of my learning experience of uh, being responsible for uh, enacting these efforts on a statewide basis. So now if I jump forward to 2000, let's say 22, mm -hmm. Jessica, when you and the team at the, so you've now relocated from Columbus, you're back in Cleveland, mm -hmm. right? And the team is saying, you know, we have, as, as you said in the, in the previous episode, we have these problems with the, the example that you gave the guardians, mm -hmm. right? Where there was the development and there was no identified, specified, quantifiable community benefits associated with that. And the leadership in the government said, no more. We got to change this, right? So now, you know, you're in, in Chris is working VP of you know, construction for the Greater Cleveland Partnership. You bring home, I'm sure, this conversation, these thoughts, right? Your your partner, your husband is a, a guy that's been, and, and I just wanna key off what you just said, Chris, about transformational change and the challenge of doing that in this diverse constituency of, of you know, people, state, you know, the boards of election, right? Some very small, some much larger, mm -hmm. the challenge of making that happen. Okay, so now you've got another challenge, right? Because if you're going to pass, you know, any ordinance, wh whatever it's gonna look like, right? You've got to deal with supply chains and development organizations and all that sort of stuff. That's kind of, I don't want to say messy, but it's complex. I had no idea how complex. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, 
but Chris did. Mm-hmm. Would that be a fair statement? Oh, sure. Well, he had been working in this sector, in this role that really he created out of nothing since 2014. And so it's 2022. At the Greater, at the Greater Cleveland, Cleveland Partnership. Partnership, mm-hmm. right. Okay. And... Um, the council president, you know, had said that he would like to advance formal formalizing a community benefits ordinance. Right. And as we quoted one of our other um, great leaders, Frank Jackson, uh, former mayor of the city of Cleveland, who said that the private sector and the public sector shouldn't be too far apart or should stay close together. Right. This was a perfect opportunity for the public sector and the private sector to work closely together. So as part of that working group that I described um, that started in July of 2022 that met every two weeks, Chris and sometimes uh, the senior vice president, Patrice Blakemore, would join him in these conversations. And so the again, the relationships that Chris had honed over years with right. project managers, project owners, I keep saying that, project owners, construction managers, and, and um, minority businesses, you know, he could bring to bear a really awesome view of the system, yeah. not just from one MBE or FBE. Right. And we really needed that perspective brought to the table because that's exactly what we were trying to do. You know, we had the internal folks in City Hall who were trying to get it done, um, you know, from a process standpoint, like how do we actually do this? Mm. And then we had the community to engage and then we had the stakeholders to engage. And I think, you know, at the end of it, I remember looking at Chris one Sunday morning and saying, what an, you know, because we did have a fear that we spent so much time together on this work product right. that we became consultants, you know, basically working on this ordinance together and frankly kind of lost our relationship a little right. bit because we were so, it was so intense. It was yeah. such an intense environment yeah. and it was constant. And um, we, you know, again, kind of were in these intense environments that we couldn't get away from. I mean, we weren't picking up and driving to Columbus every week. <laughs> and conversely, you know, we were living and breathing this all the time. Mm. And I will also mention we, for some unknown reason, we decided to have part of our condo renovated at the same time. <laughs> so that uh, created kind of a perfect storm of intensity. Yeah. And, um, And so at one point, at the end of all of it, you know, I looked at Chris and I said, as difficult as some of this has been, because we've gone too far and as, you know, we often joke too far, fall off edge. Right. um, We, you know, I said, what an amazing opportunity for me to learn about your work environment and about the work that you can, because you can tell Chris isn't somebody who just goes to work at nine and clocks out at five. Right. You know, this is the work that he does is of personal importance. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a passion. Absolutely. And so what an opportunity for me to learn. I mean, I didn't really, as I said, either to you or someone um, else yesterday, you know, community benefits, the construction sector, the construction sector partnership, they're not your typical issues, right? They're not abortion. They're not minimum wage. They're not um, gun control. You right. know, the things that the we too easily stuff. fall into talking about. This is a part of our economy. This is a really important issue that I would not have known if it weren't for my husband working in this space. And so working on the community benefits ordinance together allowed me to see his world in a way I think a lot of partners don't get to see the the other partner's world and i think you know chris too even though he knew you know how council functioned and how the legislative branch works with the administrative branch right um and that healthy tension there you know we both got an opportunity to really see what the other is dealing with and um and what a gift you know to put faces to names of all the people and companies that he had mm-hmm. you know referred to so i think you know rather than retelling the story of the community community benefits ordinance the impact uh, on me and as I see it as part of us, you know, that was it. And, and, but, and one of the things that that reminds me of is uh, uh, Jess's dad was a well-known uh, radio personality here in the city of Cleveland for many, many years. Uh, Christopher Columbi, I remember listening to his jazz shows um, as I was uh, growing up here in Cleveland. And the work that Jess just described in many ways is the same way that Jess has helped me understand and appreciate jazz music, hmm. right? They are unique instruments. We are unique instruments that have come together. Our uh, dear friend, Terry Puntremoli, who's the director of the Tri-C Jazz Festival, brings together these amazing artists. And the work of 
that we've been describing to you is a lot like jazz. It is folks show up with their unique talent, skills, and abilities. They come together and they create something. Right. They create something that is often uh, really um, extraordinary. It's impactful. And it's a direct result of a collection of individual contributions Hmm. that the whole is directly tied to the strength and uniqueness of how those individual contributions contribute to the whole. And to me, that just is, it's a wonderful, I think, um, thing for me to reflect on uh, because there are there, there's certainly that's kind of helped us kind of get through some of the tougher moments because sometimes you have to improvise. Well, I wanted to, to, to talk about that, and I wanted to pick up something, Jessica, that you had to say. Um, how did you protect, preserve the thing that's you and Chris that's not the ordinance, that's not your work, that's not those things, right? Because we've yeah. talked a lot about how your remarkable backgrounds, both of you, you know, you both have passion, you both have incredible persistence, you have work ethics that are, you know, second to none. I mean, you you work very hard, you invest a lot, I can tell, of yourselves into your work, right? Uh, You collaborate, you collaborated to make the CBO a reality, right? But there's, there's something about Chris and Jessica that is not the CBO, Right. It's not that. Oh, my good. Are we about to talk about feelings? <laughs> I'm, I'm a guy. I was going to say, can you tell about Chris keeps talking about the thing and I keep talking about the relationship? Well, I want to hear, because I think, you know, honestly, there's, there's more to the two of you than the ordinance. There's more to the two of you than your work. I, I mean, I hardly know you, but I know this is true yeah. of both of you. And there's also something special about Chris and Jessica. So how did you preserve and protect and nurture that in the middle of this, you know, maelstrom of activity, this cauldron, this, you know, how did you do that? Well, I can tell I'm getting very hot right now. Like my hands are sweaty and I'm very warm um, because uh, we didn't, I think, for a period of time. Right. Um, it was very easy to get swept up in doing the work. Yeah. And so yeah. um, we did lose sight of, well, I mean, we. I, I think, you know, we, I don't want to say we went through the motions, you know, but we'd still go out to dinner. We'd sure. still, you know, go on walks or, um, but unfortunately, I do think we, we lost what was special about me and Chris for a period of time. Right. And it did result in a bit of a bump up. But I think that that, you know, again, as we've been talking about how everything is meant to be, mm. um, it was a bump up that we needed to have right. and are stronger because of it and have a new reflection on how we do ourselves, you know, individually, but as a couple. Right. And that this is a really important lesson for us. You know, do we want to be consultants or do we want to be you know, partners and married and committed to each other in that way. And I actually heard something, you know, Chris say to you yesterday as we talked about, not only are we still married after that experience, but uh, you know, as Chris said, we want to be married. And so frankly, I think that it was a blessing in disguise because mm. it reminded us that there is something special mm. about Chris and Jess, the couple. And it's really important not to forget, you know, that very sacred space that we Absolutely. share. Absolutely. Yeah, most blessings are uh, disguised. Um, uh, would you? How did you discover the meditation book that we um, spend time in on a daily basis? So one of the things we like to do together is drive out to Chagrin Falls in yeah. every weather. We love it on gray, cloudy, stormy yeah. days, and yeah. we love it on days like today where there's not a cloud in the sky and it's sunny and a beautiful day for drive a drive. Um, fireside books. Oh uh, yes, we love fireside of books course. and the love creaky it. floor and the, yes. the yes. skinny the skinny stacks and aisles. Yes, and um, you can never have enough book bags. Yeah, no. So um, I I don't know. Uh, it, I had heard Chris say somewhere along the way again something I sort of didn't pay attention to, but that it was really important for him that the two of us, you know, make committed time together to be quiet. Mm. 
and to reflect and to you know pray or meditate together sure, sure. and i sort of shrugged it off like okay great yeah whatever you know you just do it and let me know i'm going to go to the gym right. um and uh and i i heard it in a way that i hadn't before mm-hmm. so when we went to fireside books i just found myself in a corner of these kinds of you know reflective prayer meditation books sure, sure. and i found a book um, that resonated in a very specific way mm. and I shared it with Chris and it has daily readings Absolutely in our, in our spiritual life is really important to us in in many ways of course this uh, earlier this week was Passover and uh, Jess and her mom uh, lead the family's uh, Passover uh, and it's a very much an economical you know celebration in fact I think um, Jess and her mom are the only Jewish folks at uh, at their Passover, and um, which is amazing, and we go to our cousins for second seder. Um, so, both our spiritual life as a husband and wife, our spiritual life within the context of our faith traditions. Right. Um, again, it's not either or. It's it's both and. It's who yep. it's who yep. we are, and it's yep. and it's it's bedrock um, to. Uh, how our parents raised us, it's bedrock to how we came together as husband and, and wife. And it also, I think, is absolutely core to who we try to show up for to each other, mm. you know, every day uh, and, and to others. In fact, we were with some friends this morning, speaking of, um, you know, being grounded in the spiritual experience, where we literally were having a conversation around just the importance of it's a kind of a come as you are party. Sure. You can't, sure. you can't kind of dress it up. You just, you just present yourself right. uh, as who you are and there's uh, acceptance. I was right. just going to say it, acceptance. It's is such, is, is, is such a core principle uh, that I think we both value very, very deeply. Well, uh, you know, one of the things that um, I've, I've observed and I've learned in, in my own, uh, my marriage to my bride, professional challenges, accomplishments, et cetera, it's, they will come and they will go. It's wonderful to work when you can collaboratively to accomplish great things such as you've done with the CBO. But at some point, all of that goes into the rearview mirror, you know, and it's, it becomes history. And as we were talking about in previous episodes, you know, let's roll the tape forward to 2040 and we talk about all this thing that can be. But the other thing, hopefully in 2040, is that there's a a Chris and a Jess, Mm -hmm. right? And that that is there and that that has not only, you know, not only survived, but it thrives, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something to rejoice and be excited about, right? Um, Because from my point of view, and again, this is, these are my personal values, those are the things that really, really matter, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, not, not that the CBO and all these other things don't matter, they do. And, you know, Chris, to echo something you said earlier, it's about individuals, it's about families, it's about relationships, absolutely. But in the midst of all of this stuff, we can't lose sight of who we are mm-hmm. and who we as a couple, right? The two of you are right. How important that is. So I'm I'm excited to hear that, and and I'm delighted to hear you talk about spirituality. It's something that doesn't get enough airtime without being politicized, and this is not a political thing. Uh, I think we're spiritual beings, and I think nurturing our spirits in the way all of us choose to do that, in the context of faith traditions or new traditions we discover as individuals or as couples, is a is a part of, in my opinion living a healthy, um, positive life. So, so thank you for sharing this with us. This has been marvelous. Thank you for asking. Absolutely. Indeed. And we look forward to hanging out with you and Pam. Sounds like we have a lot in common when it comes to uh, kind of navigating this uh, husband, wife, working, consulting thing. Um, yes. And, and, and I will certainly take a backseat to that conversation because my wife will drive. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I'm Mark Good. You've been listening to my remarkable podcast. For more episodes like this, as well as premium content, visit my site, markgood.substack.com.
humble 